As of January 26th, 2022, the USMLE Step 1 transitioned from a numeric score to now just being pass-fail. Step 1 has historically been the most important and stressful exam in medical school. Oftentimes, the score a student received on this exam determined which residency programs they could apply to and whether or not they could pursue the specialty they always wanted. So you can imagine that when this exam went from a score that dictates your future to now simply pass or don't pass, the medical community had a lot to say about it. The USMLE Step 1 exam has officially become pass-fail. Step 1 is now pass or fail. The most important exam for medical students is now pass and fail. Going from the most stressful performance-based test ever to now just pass fail. The overall impact of this exam going pass fail can be the topic of a separate video, but as someone who has taken this new version of step one, I wanted to walk you guys through a strategy that I think can all but guarantee a pass on this exam without feelings of being overwhelmed or stressed out. If you're new here, my name is J.R. Smith. I'm a medical student at the Mayo Clinic and I'm passionate about personal growth and I want to do that alongside you guys. So of course, before telling you guys about a strategy that you can use to easily pass step one, I of course have to show you proof that it works. All right, we are looking at step one, my step one score, even it's not scored, it's just pass fail, but we're looking at it for the first time. Okay, I shouldn't be this nervous about a pass fail exam, but I am very, very nervous. <gasps> we're good. You're gonna we be passed. a doctor. I'm gonna be a doctor. Oh, we passed. We passed. So in this video, we're going to go through a long-term study plan if you're a first-year medical student, as well as a short-term study plan if you're in your dedicated study period or just a few weeks away from your exam. Now, for a little background, I was able to pass step one without a formal dedicated study period because I essentially started studying for a step one day one of my first year of medical school, which I definitely recommend. But if it's too late for that, stick around because I have some tips that I think will make the most of your dedicated study period. So to truly easily pass step one requires a bit of foresight as a first year medical student. It means that in the midst of trying to excel in each course individually, you are also still thinking about the bigger picture. So instead of learning the material in a given block and then forgetting it all after you've taken your final exam, you are retaining all of this knowledge that you've learned and adding to that in each subsequent class. Now this definitely is not an easy thing to do and the last thing that you wanna do when you're learning new material in a new block is to be reviewing old material from previous courses. Now in order to accomplish this, you have to utilize the study technique spaced repetition, which is essentially spacing out your review of material gradually. So it starts as reviewing material every day, turns into once a week, turns into a couple times a month, and so on. Now I personally think the best tool to accomplish this is Anki, which I have spoken about at length, but it allows you to consistently review material that you've learned and however well you know that material determines how frequently you will review it. So to reiterate, the first step to easily passing step one is using space repetition throughout your preclinical years. And then all the material that you'll ultimately cover will be cemented in your memory. Before you master the test, you have to first master your understanding of the material that's going to be on that test. And instead of having the mindset of mastering one subject over the course of a few weeks and then moving on, you should instead be thinking about mastering the step one material as a whole throughout your preclinical years. And again, I understand that this is definitely the harder of the two ways to approach medical school, but by choosing to go this route, you'll not only have a relatively easier time studying for step one, but you'll develop a level of knowledge that will help you succeed in the rest of your medical school career and beyond. Now, one thing that greatly helps with your ability to master material is by learning it right the first time. And the class that sets the foundation for really everything that you learn in medical school and as a result, everything that you'll probably get tested on is anatomy. And this brings me to today's sponsor, KenHub. KenHub is my favorite resource for learning anatomy and not only guided me throughout my anatomy course, but provided concise refreshers for me as I move through each block of medical school. Depending on your learning style, you can watch videos over a given topic, browse through their atlas for quick identification, and even read articles discussing how the anatomy pertains to what you'll see in the clinic. And what makes them particularly special is they also have resources to learn histology and radiology, which are classically two of the more challenging topics for medical students. If you come in as a first year medical student in your cardiology block and can accurately read a chest x-ray, I'm sure you're gonna raise some eyebrows from your professors. But most importantly, with a solid anatomy foundation, your overall learning in medical school will be much more streamlined. 
So make sure you check KenHub out. And if you use the link in the description below, you'll get 10% off your subscription. Now, the second thing you wanna do in your preclinical time, other than becoming comfortable with the content, is becoming comfortable with the exam. And the only way to do that is through practice questions. The classic tried and true resource for practice questions is UWorld and I 100% recommend using it. And what I would recommend is as you're progressing through your courses to just do UWorld questions as you prepare for your final exams. Now, one thing that will help with getting comfortable with the style of the exam is if your school utilizes NBME exams for their finals. That means that instead of your school writing their own exams, they use questions provided from the NBME, which are the same people who write the questions for step one. If your school doesn't use NBME exams, that just means you should be trying to get even more practice by doing more questions during your blocks. Now, once you're actually nearing your step one exam and whether or not you spent your time up until this point, how we previously discussed, it's going to be critical to come up with a plan in order for you to succeed. Now, at the root of every effective study strategy or plan in general, you have to establish your goal or where you want to end up, as well as your current state or where you are in this moment. You can't determine the steps you need to take to get to your goal without first knowing those two things. Goal is easy. It's given to us. It's just a past step one in this case. But determining your current state takes a little bit of work. The best way to determine where you are in the moment is by taking a full length practice exam. And in this case, I recommend the UWorld self-assessment. You can also use the NBME practice exams, but those don't give you a score anymore and just tell you a percent likelihood of passing the exam if you take it within the next week. So to me, if you're planning on using those practice exams, it just makes more sense to use those when you're closer to the real deal. Now, again, this is something that you should do right away when you finish your pre-clerkship courses and are preparing to enter your dedicated study period. And for the most part, this is not going to be an enjoyable experience. You're taking a very long and hard exam without taking the time to really study specifically for that exam, but it is still a very essential part of the process. Now, when you take the UWorld self-assessment, it will give you a three digit score. It won't just say pass fail, which is great. So it's important to know that on the real deal, a passing score is 196. And if you approach your clerkship time how we discussed earlier in the video, this is when you can be rewarded. When I took my first UWorld self-assessment, I scored a 239, and I am definitely not sharing this to toot my own horn because I know quite a few people who scored higher than this on their first practice exam. But it's just to say that it is possible to pass step one without a dedicated study period and right after your pre-clerkship classes. Now, if you are under 196, that is completely fine. That just means you have to spend a couple weeks of dedicated studying to bring your scores up. And if that's the case, I would plan for at least four weeks of dedicated study time. And during this time, there is a general weekly framework that I recommend for maximizing your overall point increase. You've already done day one at this point, which is taking the test. Day two involves identifying weaknesses from that test and doing a dedicated UWorld question bank session on that topic. Days three through five involve general UWorld question bank sessions, so covering all topics. Day six involves content review if you find topics that need more thorough review after your five days of practice questions, and if not, more practice questions. And finally, just like the Lord did, day seven is for rest. And then you repeat this cycle every week, starting with either a UWorld self-assessment or an NBME practice exam. Now, in terms of how many practice questions you should be doing, this will ultimately depend on how close you are to passing. If you're below a 180 on the UWorld self-assessment or below a 50% chance of passing on the NBME practice exam, I recommend doing three 40 question blocks each QBank day. Now, there are a few things in my study calendar that people may or may not agree with, so let me explain. For one, you are rooting your system in practice questions. So this helps you master the exam and become comfortable with the overall testing experience, which is half the battle. And two, you are strictly reviewing the material you feel weak in, which will ultimately save a ton of time and maximize your potential for scores to improve. I often see students scheduling four to five videos to watch or chapters to read every day and trying to work through an entire video library or textbook as a part of their study strategy. There are a couple flaws with this though. First, you're spending time doing passive learning instead of active learning. Research has been clear that we learn much more when we are active in the process, doing things like practice questions, rather than passive study techniques like reading textbooks or watching videos. Now, of course, if there are general topics that you are consistently missing questions on, it is completely reasonable and recommended to spend some time watching some videos or reading up on it. And if you didn't keep up with much of the material during your pre-clerkship blocks, you may find it necessary to add another day of reviewing either on top of or in replace of a day of practice questions. But this should still be a relatively small part of your schedule because ultimately you'll learn much more through practice and you'll also become much more comfortable with the exam. Another important thing in my schedule that may be controversial, but I really don't think it should be, 
is taking a day off. It is very easy to get burnt out during long periods of studying, and this has the opposite effect you want on your score trajectory. But making sure that you're fresh, motivated, and not sleep deprived is actually part of the formula to a good test performance. And I intentionally have this the day before the next practice exam because I choose to not do anything before the real deal for those things that we just talked about. And if you don't regularly do this before practice exams, you're probably gonna be way too anxious and stressed out to do it before the real deal. But if you use this schedule, you'll realize that it's not too drastic of a time commitment. On days where you take full length practice exams, you should spend around six to seven hours taking and reviewing the exam. In days where you're working through QBanks, it should take around two hours or so for every 40 question blocks to take and review. And this is assuming that you're doing thorough review for every question. So understanding why the right answer is right and why the wrong answer is wrong. Ultimately, this will save you a lot of points in the future because I can guarantee that a wrong answer on one question is going to be a right answer on another one. But I think that around six to seven hours a day while having a day off every week is very reasonable. And once you're getting above 70% on UWorld, you'll see that this will likely translate to being well above 90% likelihood of passing on your NBME practice exams, and you'll be in great position to pass the real deal. I think the mark of 70% is a good one to go by because according to the NBME, historically it has taken around 60% correct to pass. And I think it's appropriate to have a little bit of cushion in there. And finally, after using these resources and practice exams, I recommend using this amazing website called Predict My Step Score, where you can just plug in your scores on these different things that you've been doing and how far you are from your test day. And it takes data from thousands of students to predict how you'll do on the real thing. But that's it for this video. I hope that you all enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you smash that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you're looking to develop the skill of consistency and bring that into your step one study time or really anything else in your life, make sure you check out this video here where I talk about how I was able to study over 500 days and counting. But of course, until the next one, keep evolving and I'll see you guys soon.